Love you. Thank you so much. That was so nice. Um, and I, I am really, really honored um, that all of you are out here tonight, see so many friendly faces, and I'm really excited to share my research ideas. Um, and it's a special honor to, to uh, speak tonight um, and to just be associated with Dr. Kelly's name. Um, I'm truly honored by this. Um, so I am a bulldog and a husky. And I graduated from Garfield High School here in Seattle and the University of Washington, um, as uh, Dr. Herding and Dr. Edwards Lang said. Um, and I say that to let you know that my intellectual curiosity really came from my experiences at Garfield and at the University of Washington, um, from the students I sat next to in my classes with to the students I didn't have the opportunity to sit next to, um, and also from the mentorship I received from many of the people here in this room. Um, my current research and teaching is interests are in the areas of social stratification and inequality. I'm really interested in how institutions matter in individuals' life chances. So when individuals make contact with the, the higher education system, the juvenile or the criminal justice system, what happens to them after that contact? Tonight I'll be talking about my book project and I just want to note that this isn't a, a, a romanticized tale about people involved in the criminal justice system. Instead, it's an empirical evaluation on what we do to individuals when they have contact and then the consequences post-contact. Um, I, I, before I go any further, I'd, li I'd like to acknowledge my village, if I can, um, that has supported me as a scholar and then also just a regular normal person in my life. My parents, Herb and Kathy Harris, uh, who are celebrating 43 years of marriage tonight. Uh, <laughs> the fact that they're even here tonight just is a testament to how much they've supported our family um, over the years. And then my husband, Eric Hampton. Uh, who's let me be me and supports me in any of the crazy things I say I'm gonna do. I really appreciate that. Thank you for all of your support. And then also my brothers, uh, Tony and Joe, and my sister, Deborah. thank you for being here too. I really appreciate your support. And of course, my political, personal mentor, go-to person, Council Member Larry Gossett. Thank you for being here, I appreciate it. And, and of course, my kid's Nana, Eleanor Orth. <laughs> um, I have an enormous amount of support and mentorship uh, from the University of Washington since I, first, since I was an undergrad and then since I came back as a professor. And I want to acknowledge Al Black, Bob Crutchfield, um, Catherine Beckett, Becky Pettit, Stu Tolney, or just a few, Jerry Herding, uh, or just a few of my colleagues who have had an impact on my career and my intellectual development. I just want to acknowledge you and, and thank you. And of course, my Wired sisters, raise your hands, represent Wired sisters <laughs> for being here too. All your love and support, I appreciate that. As I am a qualitative researcher, my work wouldn't be possible without the participation, the insight, uh, and the support uh, from real people. The people who make the policy, who implement it, and who are the subjects of it. I am deeply ind indebted to everyone who is willing to talk with me and let me observe their lives and share their insight and experiences. So I want to acknowledge their role in my research. And I definitely want to acknowledge my research team uh, of undergraduate, graduate students who have some way touched this project as well, and especially acknowledge Heather Evans, who has been my colleague for the past several years and has done a tremendous amount of work on past and future work. So thank you for your support, Heather. Okay. So tonight I will be speaking about my book project that is in process. I look forward to hearing any questions at the end of the talk, unless you have clarifying questions, but I'm really excited to see what you, you think of, of the presentation. I'll begin by talking briefly about the contemporary criminal justice landscape, just to get us all on the same page, talking about monetary sanctions, what I specifically study, and really framing them as an intended consequence. And I'll talk about why that's important, why I want you to think about them as being done on purpose, and then um, share some conclusions and, a discu and discussion. So the US criminal justice system. Um, like many arenas in the United States, we have an exceptional criminal justice system that my colleague Naomi Murakawa points out. Uh, as this figure illustrates, we out-convict and out-incarcerate any other industrialized country in the world. This figure here contrasts the United States incarceration rate with that of 30 other industrialized countries. And you can see that our rate per 100,000 people in the population is 753. The next country on this chart is Poland at 224. 
Since 1974, we have experienced a, a dramatic increase in the rate at which the segment of the U.S. population lives behind bars. Many scholars now use the phrases of exceptional, uh, mass incarceration, hyper-incarceration, the new Jim Crow, uh, to describe the extreme rate, uh, the extreme way in which we attempt to control crime in America. Not only have we expanded the number of people that we convict and the number of people that we incarcerate, but we've also expanded the other ways in which we try and control this population. So while they're not, they might not be incarcerated in some way, we have different tools, mechanisms to surveil, surveil these people, to keep them connected to the criminal justice system. Over the past 10 to 20 years, we've seen a large expansion of accountability courts, for example. So um, drug and alcohol, mental health, family courts, where people might not necessarily be in jail, but they're under the purview of the criminal justice system and have to to report different things, living situations, things like that. So we've seen large expansions, not only in conviction and incarceration, but the reach of the criminal justice system into our communities and into individuals' lives. And the ways in which we've done this uh, is an over-representation of people of color, is a disproportionality uh, by which people of color, namely African Americans and Latinos and Na Native Americans, are affected and impacted by the criminal justice system. So for example, while well, one in 87 working aged white men uh, is living behind bars in either prison or jail, one in 36 Hispanic men are in the same situation and one in 12 African American men are living behind bars. So one in 87 working aged white men live behind bars, one in 36 Latino men live behind bars, and one in 12 African American men live behind bars. This is a chart um, that illustrates uh, the, way, the, the racial disproportionality in conviction and incarceration. Um, it also impacts people who are under formally educated, so people who are high school dropouts, uh, and they're disproportionately impacted by the criminal justice system as well. So in terms of the education system, my colleague Becky Pettit finds that the cumulative risk of imprisonment is three to four times higher for high school dropouts than for high school graduates. So if you drop out of high school, you're three to four times more likely to be incarcerated than you are if you had stayed in high school and graduated. More young African American men, so men aged 20 to 34 years of age, without a high school diploma or GED, are currently behind bars than employed. This leads Pettit and her uh, colleague Bruce Western to conclude that imprisonment now rivals or overshadows the frequency of military service and college graduation for recent cohorts of African American men. There are dramatic economic consequences then to this incarceration and mass conviction for families, for individuals, um, and for communities uh, on a whole. Um, so to summarize, we have experienced a massive rate in conviction and incarceration and the expansion of the criminal justice system into the, to, to the lives and communities of individuals. And this has been done in a very disproportionate way to affect certain types of communities. And then third, there are dramatic economic consequences as a result of conviction and incarceration once people try to exit the criminal justice system. The total number of people living behind bars in 2010 was 2.25 million. And you can see the adult incarceration rate, both jail and prison, is 962 per 100,000. Um, and the total supervised, so the total population that in some way is responsible or has to report to the criminal justice system is just over 7 million. As a result of this exceptional criminal justice system, an entire body of legal scholarship has now emerged um, that focuses on the collateral consequences of criminal charges. Um, and these are the results of arrest, prosecution, conviction that are not necessarily part of the sentence. That's the way that these are framed. These are penalties that automatically occur or become effective upon conviction, even if it's not included in the court's judgment and sentence. Um, and this can also include any un unintended or unforeseen impacts of the charge. And so legal scholars have focused on these categories as, of, as collateral consequences. Sociologists have also focused on the prior listed categories, but also focusing on health impacts, neighborhood, community reentry processes, and community distress and fear of the criminal justice system. These two bodies of work focus on these, uh, frame these as un being unintended um, consequences, done 
on accident, essentially, not as a direct result of what was going on in the criminal justice system or the intention of what the criminal justice system um, has been doing. My research focuses on something called monetary sanctions or financial penalties Sorry. Um, that are imposed as a result of felony conviction. There are a wealth of financial penalties associated with conviction and a subset are imposed at the point of sentencing and I'll give a little more detail. In both the legal and the sociological research that has been done to date, frames monetary sanctions as being unintended consequences. Um, and even in our prior work, we have framed these as being collateral or unintended. Based on the current research that I'm going to present to you tonight, I argue that we need to reframe this notion of collateral consequences and recognize that this process and its outcomes are very intentional. For the remainder of my talk, I will define and describe how monetary sanctions are used nationally and in Washington state, and then argue why it's important for us to really rethink this um, and the sentencing process as being intentional. There are, are several types of financial consequences related to criminal conviction. Um, I want you to think of these two sets right now. The first is restitution, and that's assessed to an individual uh, as a direct result of having a victim that was in some way harmed, and the frame is that um, the person needs to make the victim whole. A second set are financial penalties that are related to the type of sentence. So nowadays, any type of sentence literally has some type of financial cost to the defendant. So if you're sentenced to alcohol and drug assessment and treatment in the community, the defendant has to pay for that assessment and has to pay for that treatment, which can range from $500 to $3,000. If the defendant does not pay for the cost of, of that, then they are labeled as not fully completing their sentence, right, and will be in violation of the court orders. So these are two sets of types of financial penalties associated with conviction that I will not be focusing on tonight. I just wanted to note that they're here. What I focus on, focus on is on something called monetary sanctions or legal financial obligations, LFOs. And these include fines, fees, costs, and surcharges that are imposed to the victim at the point of sentencing. So if a, I mean, I'm sorry, de defendant. So when a defendant is convicted of something, they will be sentenced, they will get six months in jail or six months suspended time, and they will get an LFO. From that day of sentencing, 12% interest begins accruing on that $5,000 they are assessed. In addition, if they are unable to pay that off, every year $100 will be added to that amount for collection services. This occurs at every level of conviction in Washington State. I focus just on the Superior Court felonies in Washington. In Washington, as, uh, as usual with most jurisdictions across the nation, the county clerks are responsible for collecting the, the, the money. Until one pays off everything in full, they do not regain full civil rights, essentially. They cannot be full citizens or enact their citizens' rights. They cannot take uh, advantage of deferred prosecutions. They cannot carry weapons. They cannot serve on juries. Their right to vote is only provisional and can be removed at any time if they're not making regular payment. So this non-payment is treated as violation of court orders. A sample of possible legal financial obligations in Washington state, what is viewed as mandatory uh, is a victim penalty assessment, a VPA in the amount of $500, regardless if there's a victim. So anybody who's convicted of any felony in Washington state is assessed a VPA of $500. In addition, they're assessed $100 for a DNA collection. The assumption is, is that someone convicted of something today either committed an offense in the past or has the potential of committing an offense in the future, and so their DNA a sample is collected in order to identify them. In Washington, while there's the same statute that governs how this is supposed to work in the courtrooms, there's great, a great deal of variance across the counties. Some of the other items that are viewed as optional are the cost of a public defender. If you can't afford one, one will be appointed to you, but you will have to pay for it after conviction. Costs for a juries, uh, a bench warrant, or court costs, such as filing fees and various paper, pieces of paper that are filed on your behalf. So for example, and I use pseudonyms for my counties that I focused on, but in Langston County, I've observed a white man, 30 years of age, pled to an assault uh, and received a $1,000 LFO. So he received the 500 VPA, the $100 DNA collection, and $400 charge for his public defender. However, in Alexander County, he was only assessed the $500 VPA. Um, and he, he wasn't charged for his public defender. So there's a great de deal of variability in the ways in which these are assessed. 
Nationally, what do we know? We know based on data from the Bureau of Justice uh, Statistics that about two-thirds or 66% of prison inmates surveyed uh, pay some sort of monetary uh, sanctions or penalties as a result of their conviction. And this is a dramatic increase since 1991 from 25% to 66%. And the bulk of that is the paying for the costs and the fees of their processing, essentially. Who gets assessed? Who's getting this? Based on a sample of data that we have from the Administrative Office of the Courts, 3,300 cases, the average amount is about $1,400 based on our 2004 sample. Um, the average for Latinos, however, is just over $1,600. Using a statistical analysis, holding priors, legal characteristics constant, factors that influence the amount of a, at assessment was, was whether or not you were convicted of a drug offense, if you went to a trial, if you opt, opted for a trial of some sort, if you live in a politically conservative county, that's a county with a higher percentage of people voting Republican in the last presidential election, and being Latino. Offense being held constant, priors being held constant. If you're Latino, you're going to have higher fines and fees assessed to you in Washington state. So a summary of prior research, monetary sanctions are regularly imposed nationally. Legal debt is typically substantial relative to the expected earnings of the felon and ex-felon and usually becomes a long-term obligation for individuals, in part due to the interest and the surcharges that are occurring over time. Monetary sanctions add to our current understandings of the general social and economic burdens of incarceration by reducing, knowing that they reduce family income and create long-term debt uh, and increase the chances of ongoing criminal justice involvement. I'll talk about why in just a moment. And in terms of the sentencing process, we know that uh, monetary sanctions reduce family income and create long-term debt over the life course. Sorry, I flipped those two. That non-legal factors are significantly influence uh, the amount assessed. So factors not related to the, the current charge or the prior history. As a result of the prior research that I've done and that's been done on this topic, I decided I really want to investigate the sentencing process. How can we explain this on the ground level at the courthouse? How are judges making assessment decisions? What happens if someone doesn't or can't pay? What is the reasoning behind the imposition of the real debt to these individuals? So over the past uh, four years, in addition to the data set we had from the Administrative Office of the Courts, the 3,300 cases, I decided to sort of dig into what we could find out, what I could find out at the ground level. Uh, with the help of graduate students and undergraduate students, I've coded and looked through national and Washington state legal cases and statutes. I've uh, done interviews with people convicted of felonies, and some of those were done with colleagues in the past. I've also done interviews with judges, with clerks, with prosecutors, with defense attorneys, with state legislators, anyone who anyway touched this process. I was interested in understanding what they do, what is their role. I selected five counties in Washington State, and I use pseudonyms. I don't use the real names of those counties. Um, and I've also done observations of over 140 sentencing and then violation hearings in those five counties. What I found is that these monetary sanctions are not unintended consequences, but rather are a very intentional sanction that are imposed to individuals. This idea is an important one in the general way we talk about the contemporary criminal justice system. It is important for how we conduct research on the criminal justice system, and most importantly, it's important, it has very real consequences for how we as citizens approach public policy and our understandings about punishment in society. I argue that this intentionality exists at two levels. We can look at it in that way. One, at the state legislature, where the LFO code is created, and at the court level, where local policies are created and implemented in both policy and in action as they're imposed. I argue that both policymakers and practitioners intend to impose, purposefully impose, monetary sanctions to all citizens convicted of felonies in Washington state, and monetary sanctions are used as a form of indeterminate justice in Washington state. What does indeterminate justice mean? In 1981, the Washington state legislature decided that we wanted to move from an indeterminate system, a system in which defendants would get a range of a sentence, they wouldn't know how many days they were going to serve, to a more concrete sentencing grid, a determinate sentencing grid. So when you're convicted, you know how much time you're going to spend when you're in jail or prison. So we moved from an indeterminate system to a determinate system. Ironically, in 1989, the legislature codified the LFO legislation, and it created a system in which it's very indeterminate. So if you are poor, if you can't pay this debt, you will literally have a permanent punishment hanging over your head. 
I'm going to outline why to, uh, evidence to support this intent at the policy setting level. And this is a very straightforward point, but again, it's an important point. Ride with me to the end, and I'll explain why it's important, OK? First, it's assessed to every person convicted of a felony. It's not assessed based on what a person can pay. If you're convicted of a felony, you are assessed at least that 500 and then the 100 if you haven't already had the DNA assessment. Sometimes you're charged a couple times for the DNA. Your DNA is not supposed to change, but sometimes I've seen people who have already had the DNA assessment and they're charged multiple times for the DNA draw. Second, interest and collection costs are imposed. 12% interest is imposed at the point of sentencing and then the $100 surcharges uh, every year if you can't pay it off. Third, this debt has been extended purposefully for life. So prior to July 1, 2000, an individual who was convicted of offense had 10 years to pay their debt. If they hadn't paid it off, it would basically be wiped clean. The prosecutors could uh, petition the court to extend it for another 10 years, but after 20 years, that was it. After July 1, 2000, the most recent legislation now has extended this forever. So once you're assessed, you will have it forever now until you can pay it off, and you cannot declare bankruptcy on this, on this debt. The fourth argument, or the fourth piece of evidence, is that these economic sanctions are tied to individual civil rights. Um, even in Washington State just recently, 2009, individuals have a provisional right to vote, but if you do not make regular payments, then that provisional right to vote can be taken away. Thus, the legislature clearly intended this law to be applied to every person regardless of their ability to pay and allows the debt to permanently remain with serious consequences even when the defendant is unable to pay it off. So for example, state legislator Scott, again a pseudonym, um, shows very, a very clear intent when talking about LFOs to, uh, when imposing them uh, to defendants. The aim is to use the debt as a means to hold offenders accountable for their decisions as he describes. Policymakers with whom I spoke to and observed through online debates um, argue that this is good policy that will give defendants the motivation to change their lives and right their wrongs. They are expected to pay for their crimes via community service or jail or prison um, and to literally pay for all costs associated with their offense and even their processing through the criminal justice system as Scott explains here. In an interview with George, I asked what the reasoning was behind linking voting rights with LFO payments. And he describes that this privilege, the privilege to vote, as he describes it, is a good tool to use uh, to encourage repayment if it gives defendants an incentive to pay their restitutions and other LFOs. So it's very clear when talking with policymakers, reading policy, and looking at online debates that they want to impose it to everyone, that the intent is to clearly impose to everyone, regardless of who they are and whether or not they can pay and to use this debt as a form of an indeterminate justice. You cannot fully pay off your debt to society until you fully pay off your debt to society, even if you're poor. Second, on the second level, so that's at the policy setting level. At the second level, the policy implementation level, judges and, and mostly clerks who are responsible for the collections, um, assessed amounts are not based on your income. So I've, and through the courts, uh, I've observed in sentencing, homeless people, disabled people, unemployed people are expected to pay. And I'll provide an example in just a minute. Um, if one owes debt, he or she will always be connected with the criminal justice system. And it also requires continual court involvement. So you can be um, ordered to court every month. You have to report any change of address. You have to report any source of income of employment. And if you don't, it can lead to warrants and even incarceration. So if you're viewed as in violation of a non-payment, you can receive 60 days per violation in jail for non-payment. So for example, this is my grandma case in James County, again a pseudonym, a uh, public defender shared this person's file with me. She was a 60 year old wi wi widow with medical conditions. Most recently she became very ill and was in a wheelchair. She was ordered initially just, just it's very relative, right? But $420 in fines and fees and $4,000 in restitution. But because of the interest, um, she had paid everything off and she was working on paying the interest. The interest had built up so much over time. Her total annual income was $8,000. She, individuals have to do a financial declaration with the clerk's office and cite every source of income. Through that accounting, the clerk and, and the woman realized that she had $21 in discretionary funding each month. 
Um, however, she was still ordered to pay $50 per month towards this interest by the judge. The judge threatened her with jail for non-payment because she had missed some payments. She was recently ill. The outcome of the case, and the public defender was extremely happy with this, that the interest was reduced by 50%. So that was a win for that public defender. In contrast, in Alexander County, interest is frequently waived. Um, so it's very different processes. Um, but the point is, is that people who cannot afford this or who are disabled or on disability are um, the subject uh, to pay this just like anyone else. Other punishment consequences, uh, for example, in James County, they have an auto jail policy. Um, in this county, uh, defendants are sentenced. They receive their LFO. Oftentimes, warrants will be issued for non-payment. They'll be picked up, brought to jail. And in the jail, the clerks will visit the individual in the jail without an attorney present and ask the person, tell the person, you will be re released if you sign this promissory note. The promissory note says, basically, that they promise to pay a certain payment amount per month. And if they don't, that they have to pass go and automatically report for jail. So they automatically go to jail if they miss a payment. Um, and they spend 60 days in jail for contempt of court. Another example in Warrant County, it, they, have a, they literally call it a pay or stay option. Um, warrants are issued for non-payment regularly. Uh, they have the unit uh, that calls people and they'll say, uh, you have a warrant out, pay, come in, pay $300 cash and we'll remove the warrant. Um, if you go to this county on any given day, and any one of you can do it, uh, but you don't know what county is, but anyway, if you go any day, <laughs> just dawned on me, sorry, any day you can go and sit in this court, uh, and you can see they have the first appearance calendar, and you'll see five to eight people, I've done it, I showed up on a random day, five to eight people who were picked up the night before for non-payment, and they include people who were sleeping in a park. They'll go through the parks and, and pick up people who have warrants. Um, so if you're arrested at arraignment, this, this uh, first appearance calendar, the judge will say, pay $75, it drops in the amount, um, or spend 15 days in jail. You got anybody that can give you $75? Call somebody. How much do you have in your pocket? Pay $75, or you're going to stay 15 days in jail. So these are the punishment consequences connected to this debt. So why does this matter? Right? Why, why, why does this matter? I don't know if I have to explain why it matters, but I'm going to explain, right? It has humongous implications for inequality in our society. Um, alongside the expansion of punishment, uh, mass incarceration, mass conviction, uh, we have a mass imposition of legal debt that's being ignored or not understood or recognized. And it continues to grow as a result of interest in surcharges nationally. It's also important in terms of thinking about inequality in society. The system creates what I call a rubber band effect. It cements inequality um, for people who are already poor, undereducated, from marginalized communities. They come into the contact with the criminal justice system. They have very poor economic consequences once they get out, and then we impose legal debt to them. So it's exceptional if I was Dr. Evil, right? This is an exceptional or a fantastic tool for stratification. It's a perfect tool, right? It creates a permanent punishment for the poor. It creates social, economic, and political marginalization. So why does this intent matter? It's, it matters because it's a significant inequality producing process that is not produced by accident. This is not a collateral consequence. It's not unintended, but it's very intentionally imposed to people. Second, it provides us a broader understanding of U.S. society. If we can step back a bit, we can see uh, when, that when we talk about intentionality, with this specific example of monetary sanctions, there is a long history in this country linking poor people and people of color with legal debt, political disenfranchisement, and social and economic marginalization. Various forms uh, of formal and informal systems of social control revolved around the imposition of monetary sanctions to mostly poor and mostly black people who are convicted wrongly and with reason by the criminal justice system. Institutions such as debtor's prisons, convict leasing, and forced labor camps were used by the United States and local governments to extract free labor, but also to remove citizenship rights. The linkage between social control institutions that overselect for the poor and for people of color is cemented in both the history of our criminal justice practices, but also in current practices when we consider the monetary sanctions. The presence of monetary sanctions really highlights the current form of this type of punishment. So another reason why intent matters is that this is a piece of a much broader historical process. It also matters because of policy engagement. 
for policymakers, defendants, citizens, practitioners, we shouldn't think of monetary sanctions as collateral. We need to acknowledge that this is being done on purpose and it can't be ignored. Knowing then that this process of monetary sanctions and the related consequences are imposed on purpose and the responsibility of addressing these problems really sets on the shoulders of citizens because this is done in our name. As I said with the first slide, again, my research isn't about saying people shouldn't be held accountable. In fact, the people that we interviewed said repeatedly, I want to pay back society. I want to pay my, the, my restitution. I want to directly fix the person that I hurt. That's right. But I want to be able to know that I can fulfill and be accounted, fulfill my original sentence and be held accountable. But if I can't, why bother? That's what many of them said. So then in evalu evaluating this process, I ask you, you to consider the following three questions. Is this an effective policy? Is it protecting the public? Does it pr promote rehabilitation? Is it cost effective? Is it an efficient process? Is it swift? Is it imposed in a uniform way? Is it equally distributed and borne across all offenders? Is it ethical? Is it proportional to the offense? Is it attainable for all offenders? My research to date suggests that the answer is no. So tonight I've illustrated how the contemporary criminal justice system is intentionally imposing economic burdens to millions of people who are disproportionately poor, uh, undereducated people of color with minimal legal job prospects. Monetary sanctions are not unintended consequences. They are, in fact, a gateway to a host of other collateral consequences. And they are clearly imposed purposefully. As a result, millions of people are losing their civil rights, their families are negatively impacted, and they suffer from a host of legal and social consequences. All of these factors inhibit their ability to successfully reintegrate into society. They are socially, politically, and economically marginalized and left in a permanent state of punishment for literally their entire lives. So thank you so much for listening to the talk. I really appreciate it. Thank <laughs> you.